Her gospel lesson comes from Matthew, 16th chapter, verses 13 through 20. Listen for God's word. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, are one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for the flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the disciple, the Messiah. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord. Watching from the sideline, we, all of us, we see Jesus sitting with his disciples and it's a good time to take a pause in the story and look back at some of the amazing events and stories in Matthew's gospel leading up to this scene. Jesus has become well known, talked about even as far north as Syria and over into Jordan and in all the surrounding villages and towns in the Hula Valley and the Galilee region. Even the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees traveled days up from Jerusalem to engage him in questions and try to test him. Thousands were beginning to follow him, even camping out two and three days to listen to his preaching. In Matthew's gospel, we hear about two different accounts where Jesus feeds thousands. In the first story, he feeds 5,000. And in the second account, he feeds 4,000. And in both settings, it is loaves of bread and fish. Jesus prayed upon meager numbers and miraculously, they were multiplied and then fed to the multitudes. Great crowds came to him for healing, he dined with sinners, and he even walked on water to get in the disciples' boat. So, in this interlude, in this time of pause, Jesus is alone with the disciples with the time to check in with them. So he asks the question, who do the people say that I am? And they tell him of all the names and titles and remarks that they've heard from the crowd. While I was away on vacation, I happened to come across Bart Ehrman's book, How Did Jesus Become God? And I'm sure some of you in the EFM group are reading this book, as I noticed that it was sitting on the church office in the desk on the church office and discover that it's something that you all are going to discuss. So I decided to read it and discover the section in the book titled, Who Did Jesus Think He Was? And it is a discussion regarding why Jesus was called the Messiah. Ehrman gives a detailed description of the term, explaining the single most common descriptive title that was applied to Jesus in the early years of the Christian movement, and that term was Christ. 
It is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word for Messiah, saying Jesus Christ means saying Jesus is the Messiah. And the word Messiah in Hebrew means one who is anointed, chosen and specifically honored by God in order to fulfill God's purpose and mediate God's will on earth. This future anointed one, this Messiah would be like a great ancestor David, a mighty warrior, a skilled politician, and he would be called to overthrow the oppressors and would bring a restored kingdom. Jesus' followers thought that during his lifetime, he, they believed he might be this coming anointed one. And in fact, they often called him Christ rather than Jesus. And although Eregman believes that Jesus did nothing in his life to make anyone think he was the anointed one because he did not come out of the clouds of heaven to judge the living and the dead, and he never raised an army and drove out the Romans from the promised land. But his earliest followers concluded that he was the Messiah because of his death and resurrection. And it just seemed that through the life and death of Jesus, whom we call the Christ, a new concept evolved around our understanding about what it means to be the Messiah. Jesus' message was not about the overthrowing of the Roman government or him becoming a political ruler. In fact, Ehrman describes him as a pacifist who tells his folks to love your enemies or become peacemakers and turn the other cheek. It just seems that Jesus did not seek power or authority and that he understood his work in terms of service. And I feel because Jesus saw his role in the future kingdom of God and that his message is linked to a messianic hope and promise for a future that was coming and was near. Because his very first words he spoke in the beginning of his ministry, taken from the Gospel of Mark, which is the first gospel written, these were his words. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. So when Jesus asked the disciples who did they think he was, Simon Peter answered for himself and for the group, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus blessed Peter, affirmed him because finally Peter sees and understands Jesus' true nature. Simon, you, clearly the leader and spokesperson of the disciples, you finally understand who Jesus really is. Although in two texts, the stories pass that Peter gets confused again and, and Jesus argues and fusses at him and tells him to get out of the way. But at this point in time, he gets it. Simon Peter finally understands Jesus' calling and his ministry of healing and reconciliation. And he sees in Jesus God's power, God's purpose, God's unconditional love expressed, and God's intention for God's creation. Peter understands now what Jesus meant by God's reign is drawing near close by. And now with Peter's confession of faith in Jesus Christ, the Messiah, this group of disciples and followers standing close by become a new community of faith. They become the church. The church that Matthew talks about in his gospel and is not written anywhere else in the gospels but only in Matthew. And Jesus tells Peter, you are the rock that I will build my church on. 
So here on this corner, we can leave the sideline now where we've been standing and we can walk out and join the crowds. Those who have been following Jesus and the disciples and if they ask us, who do we think we are? We can answer. We can give our confessions of faith too that we are called Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, son of the living God. For we have come to faith. We have come to faith and been baptized and have been anointed and marked as Christ's own forever. But just like Peter and the disciples, we have come to faith at a time in our lives, not from our own human experiences that bring this conclusion to us, but we have cr created this faith and by way of what the Apostle Paul says in today's epistle lesson, we were transformed by the renewing of our minds. The Spirit of God inspired us. The Spirit of God entered our lives and changed us. A change, a wonderful change came over us. But we each have our own stories. And God's Spirit has drawn us in together and called us into the community of believers who have decided to follow Jesus the Christ. And we have become the body of Christ. And individually, we are members of one another. And we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to each of us from God. Daryl Guber, who edits this book, The Missional Church, says, and I quote, the church carries Jesus' mantle as the people of God. Our responses of compassion and service, like our actions for peace and justice, are deeds of authority unto God, and therefore signs that the reign of God is present now in our world and is on the way as its future. Our responses may be small and personal, like a cup of cold water or a warm blanket, or they may be bold, like rising up and walking or lobbying for just laws to vote. Solidarity with the oppressed people, initiations, initiatives to cease hostilities among warring nations and care for suffering victims. Whatever our response may be, they will bring wholeness and dignity to the world." End quote. So today, Covenant, on this very day, our world is so much in turmoil there's a military buildup happening in the Ukraine. The conflicts between the Palestinians in Gaza and Israelis continue to flare, and homes and villages and innocent people are being killed, or homes being destroyed. Terrorist groups are kidnapping innocent people and executing individuals in front of cameras for the world to see. The Ebola outbreak in West Africa continues to kill people every day. And here in our own country, in Ferguson, Missouri, tensions are still high after the shooting of two young men by police. Lord, fear and uncertainty has entered our lives. And I fear for my five grandsons who can be profiled even as they walk to school in Shaker Heights. And we should be concerned about the welfare of the hundred children who enter our doors weekly for tutoring, their faces familiar to us. And when I arrived home each night this past week to watch the news, I found myself standing on the sidelines watching protest marches, so familiar, similar, 
a repeat of a half a century ago when many of us here, many of us who were seniors, <laughs> marched as youth with guns being pointed even at us. Watching protest marches so familiar. And on the first nights I saw the outbreak of rioting and only saw the crowds running and tear gases filling the air. But by the end of the week, I finally saw marching in the group clergy and a crowd that was more diverse and seemed more calm and united. And by this weekend, I heard that leaders were evolving and planning was beginning and prayers that now will help draw factions together and calm this unrest, and to find solutions to bring civil and just rights to those in that community. Lord, we need to pray. We need to unite as your church and respond with bold actions. We need to step off the curve and join the crowd and march for solidarity for the oppressed. We must pray for our youth, our own youth, our young adults, our youth who are going out of the country this very week to live and work in other parts of the world. They too will take up the mantle for justice. For as the church, we have the deeds of authority under God. We are commissioned to do in Jesus' name the work to help build up and support those who are in need. So covenant, as we think on these things, this day shall close. The scriptures during these days let us be encouraged, inspired, and comfort us in our wakings and in our retiring. And as we look at what Paul has to say to us here now, as we encounter the world, let us take this with us. And it's a continuation of the text that we had read by Jenny this day. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, but ardent, be ardent in spirit and serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers, and bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, and live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly, and do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Amen.